Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, Gardening for Wildlife. I'm Sarah Muriello with Pasadena Humane, and with us today is our presenter, Catherine Pacraduni, native plant horticulturalist with Theodore Payne Foundation. Hey Catherine. Hello. So we're really excited to have everyone here today for this amazing webinar. Uh, but before I hand it over to Catherine, I do just wanna share with you a few webinar reminders. So give me a minute to switch screens. All right, here we go. So we just wanna remind you that all of you are automatically muted. So we're not gonna be able to hear you, but you should be able to hear us. Um, and we can't see you, but you should be able to see us and or our screens. We're gonna ask that you save your questions for the end. Catherine's presentation is going to take up the full hour today. There's a lot of information to share. So we'll probably um, get a little bit into a second hour, about 15 minutes or so uh, for the Q&A. So if you need to jump off early, no worries. Um, you're gonna receive a recording of this webinar tomorrow afternoon, but we did wanna let you know that we're gonna use the full hour for the presentation. The way that you're gonna ask questions is by submitting them in the chat box. Um, to the left, you'll see that example, but we ask that you not raise your hand during this webinar. We won't be using the audio feature, so if you raise your hand to ask a question, we won't be able to hear you. So go ahead and submit any questions you may have in that drop-down box under questions. Your questions will only be seen by me, and as time permits, I'll go ahead and get them over to Catherine during the Q&A. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so tomorrow you'll receive an email with a link to this recording that you can watch um, at any time. And for all of our webinars and workshops, um, you can visit pasadenahumane.org slash workshops and register for any upcoming ones um, in September. All right, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Catherine. Just give us a couple seconds to switch our screen. All right, can everybody see my screen, even though you guys can't answer me? Sarah, can we see yeah. my screen? <laughs> All right, we sure great. can, yeah. All right, okay, so my name is Catherine Pacraduni. Uh, I'm a native plant horticulturist at the Theodore Payne Foundation for Wildflowers and Native Plants in Sun Valley. If you are attending this uh, Gardening for Wildlife webinar, hopefully you are interested in the topic of attracting and supporting wildlife in your front yard, backyard, patio, uh, balcony, etc. Um, so the way that the, this uh, webinar is kind of going to be divided is I'd like to provide you with a little bit of context in the beginning about California and where we are and how unique it is with regards to its uh, biology. Um, and then we're going to move into things you can do or include in your yard that will uh, attract and support uh, wildlife habitat and uh, also things that you can um, undo or consider uh, not doing that would uh, promote uh, better conditions for wildlife. And then uh, finally, uh, things to avoid doing so that you don't create wildlife problems in your yard. And so just to start with the context, um, California is a very, very unique and biologically rich region. It has uh, 6,500 uh, unique species of plants. That's more than any other state in continental United States combined. It is biologically and geologically incredibly diverse. As a result, it has also um, about a third of its plants being endemic. Endemic means these are plants that occur nowhere else on the planet. They are... Uh, irreplaceable if they were to be lost. And for that reason, Conservation International has designated the California Floristic Province as a biodiversity hotspot because it contains more than 1,500 species of plants that occur nowhere else on the planet. That's incredibly unique. Another thing that designates um, a, a region, and there are only about 36 regions uh, that are considered biodiversity hotspots in the world. Another thing that designates it as a hotspot is the fact that it's incredibly threatened. 
So California has lost more than 75% of its natural vegetation. And to be considered a biodiversity hotspot, you have to be operating on less than 30% of your natural vegetation. So natural vegetation meaning our wild lands and forgive me there, um, our wild lands and uh, native plants and all the animals, of course, that rely on that vegetation for survival. And so this here is a, an image of some of uh, some intact native ecosystem. And like I said, the plants are the foundations of the food chain. And so to lose that much land, to have lost that much land to development, to our homes, to our farmlands, uh, to our supermarkets and roads, means we've also lost that many animals and that much wildlife, anything from insects all the way to our top predators. So how do we help? How do we uh, create positive change? Uh, is it by bulldozing all of this and trying to create this out of it? I don't think that that's gonna be possible. But one thing we can do is we can preserve and conserve our last remaining open lands, our last remaining wild spaces, and we can get our own hands dirty by combining this with this to get this. Our front yards, our backyards, our patios, our balconies, our parkways, our street medians, our public lands, etc., can become habitat for wildlife and can support a, a high level of biodiversity. And so that's the goal of um, uh, this, this talk is to talk about how we can support and create habitat in our own gardens. And habitat is an environment in which an organism can receive all of its um, necessary things for survival at all life stages. And so in order to create quality habitat, we need to provide food for all life stages and natural food for all life stages. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, shelter and cover where animals can feel safe from predators. I will say that my own uh, introduction into this type of gardening was due to the fact that um, my own dogs used to um, kill fledgling birds. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the bird life cycle, Birds spend a certain amount of time, baby birds will spend a certain amount of time in their nests. And then once they get too big for their nest, they drop out of the nest, but they can't fly yet. They have feathers, but they can't quite fly. So they're grounded for a week or two. Um, at which point I had no um, shrubs, I had no bushes, I had nothing to protect them. So I had trees and pretty much bare ground. And so they became targets for my dogs. And every, year after year, they would kill baby birds. And so I determined to do something about that. And so that was my, again, gateway into uh, this kind of um, gardening mentality. So food, shelter, cover, nesting sites, again, in the form of plants, nesting materials, which will again be in the form of plants or matter or material um, from plants. So all four of these uh, conditions uh, are, are met through plants. And forgive me, the... It is not switching screens. There we go. All right, so our native plants, um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with native plants, I'm talking about indigenous species of plants. The um, indigenous species of plants are plants that have occurred here and have lived here for millennia. They were here prior to European contact in California. So native plants of California were here prior to European contact. They have co-evolved with the animals, the fungi, the microbes, and all other organisms, including people, um, to form a complex network of relationships. The animals are attuned to these plants and derive uh, benefit and nutrition from these plants in a way that is most often superior to introduced plants from elsewhere. So they are the foundations of our ecosystem. Native plants have other benefits as well. So water conservation is one uh, another gateway or avenue that people um, take to uh, starting native plant gardens. It's because of the desire to convert their lawn into uh, maybe a drought tolerant uh, native garden instead of uh, a water guzzling kind of um, garden. They tend to be low maintenance. Uh, many plants have incredible fragrances like our native sages. They have beauty. 
They um, do not require fertilization. They are adapted to our climates and our soils. So they are adapted to nutrient poor soils. So they require much fewer inputs in order to keep them alive and happy and thriving because they evolved in this area. They evolved with the climate, they evolved with the animals, they evolved with um, the whole you know, situation and conditions of California. And again, obviously taking into account that California has numerous little microclimates, so you'd have to you know, adapt based on those microclimates. But more than that, um, to the focus of this class is how essential they are for providing habitat for wildlife. That's a sweet little native bee on the plant there. So native plants are the foundations of the food web. So we've already talked about, you know, we, we require plants. Even if you eat animals, you require plants because you eat the animals that require plants to, to, for their own survival. So native plants start the entire food chain. And more than that, or not more than that, but also uh, in, in that realm, uh, insects are the starts of the food chain. And one uh, particular thing that is really, really critical if we wanna talk about creating habitat for wildlife is the presence of caterpillars in the garden. And most of the time you say, uh, my garden has tons of caterpillars. Most people are either grossed out by that concept uh, or they say, oh, that's a pest. And yet those same people that would say caterpillars are a pest love the idea of having twittering songbirds in their yard and having kaleidoscopes of butterflies fluttering across their, their window. Uh, they love the idea of birds and butterflies, and yet they would designate a pest, the very thing that is required for the thriving of birds and butterflies, because caterpillars are the main food source of baby birds. You will not get birds reproducing if it were not for caterpillars. So the more caterpillars are attracted to your yard, that means the more birds will be attracted to your yards, the more birds will be um, reproducing in your yards, the more baby birds, the more song birds, the more songs will be uh, filling your, your yard with its symphony. And so caterpillars are a critical part of the food chain in that conversation. And likewise, everyone loves butterflies. Caterpillars are baby butterflies. So the ones that don't get eaten by birds uh, end up becoming the beautiful, colorful butterflies that we all know and love, including the monarch uh, butterfly. And so if you look here at this diagram of monarch life cycle, you have the monarch adult butterfly lays an egg on a host plant, and we'll get into that again, but they have specific host plant. The caterpillar munches on those leaves until it gets nice and big and fat. Uh, if a bird doesn't pick them off, I mean, milkweed for monarchs tends to protect them from birds, but uh, if a bird doesn't pick off any other caterpillar, then it becomes nice and fat, has enough energy reserves to form itself into a chrysalis where it metamorphos uh, metamorphoses, if that's the word, um, and then comes out as another adult butterfly and um, completes that cycle all over again. So um, that having caterpillars in the yard not only creates more songbirds, but it also creates more butterflies. And those are two things that most people can agree upon, enrich and, and really beautify our, our gardens. So butterflies and moths need both nectar plants and host plants. So a lot of times you'll have people say, I'm gonna do a butterfly garden, so I need lots of flowers. And that's true for nectar. Uh, butterflies are, are pretty generalist when it comes to nectar. Some, you know, certain flowers are, are better for nectar than others, but most butterflies can sip from a variety of different kinds of flowers. But not all butterflies can lay eggs on a variety of different kinds of plants. They do require a particular host. So something like, uh, the monarch requires milkweed. Okay, so we often sell, unfortunately, the tropical milkweed, which um, causes some uh, issues uh, in the monarch population. So you'll want to find something ideally that's a little bit more local. Um, and so uh, you'll want to make sure that you're providing both, both host plants as well as nectar plants for your butterflies. And that's something you can do research on. Or if you just have a really well diversified uh, native garden, the likelihood that you're providing both host and nectar plants is gonna be pretty high. Uh, if you have a particular butterfly you're, you're really a attracted to and you really, really like that you know uh, are local to this region, 
um, don't pick something from another country that you know may not even you know come here. Uh, but something that's generally local to your region, you want to attract more of it. Uh, then you can you know do a little bit more specific specific research and get those specific plants. But a nice, well diversified native garden should provide some host and nectar plants for butterflies. Again, we talked about caterpillars um, and and trying to avoid the ick factor of of caterpillars in your garden. And likewise, we need to um, unpack and, and uh, unlearn some of the negative biases we have against insects. Because this quote, insects are the little things that run the world, is very, very true. If we lost all insects, uh, we would all die. That is just an un unfortunate or fortunate reality uh, that, that our lives are so um, intertwined that insects are, are something that we cannot do without. They are essential pollinators. It's estimated that in the United States, every year insects provide uh, $3 billion worth of pollination services, and that also $4.5 billion worth of pest control uh, uh, you know, value to humans. They're also food for other insects and animals. They're a critical part of the food chain. They are decomposers of organic waste. Imagine if, if nothing could decompose it would or it take insanely a long amount of time to decompose that would be a hellish landscape um, and there are population regulators of other organisms when we talk about insects and we talk about pollinators and attracting pollinators the usual thing people think about is the the honeybee everybody gets really jazzed about the honeybee save the honeybee but it's really important to know where you live and california has a thousand six hundred known species of bees and none of them are the European honeybee. And it's really important to know that because these bees are under a lot of threat. Um, they are ground nesting or wood nesting. They do not form the kinds of colonies or hives that you're used to with um, European honeybees. For that reason, they're also not as territorial. They have underdeveloped stingers. They do not sting in the same way. They do not get aggressive in the same way. Um, and they're amazingly efficient pollinators. And they're so efficient um, because they also come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They are uh, very, very uh, unique, and but they require a variety of uh, flower shapes and sizes um, in order to, to be in that habitat. They require a diverse wild um, habitat area um, with lots of flowers um, and, and lots of diversity in order to thrive. And so why is that significant? because they're actually more efficient pollinators than the European honeybee. But because the European honeybee, which is an agricultural import, um, is able to be domesticated, meaning you can put them in a box and you can take them to a farm and you can say, here, European honeybee, it's your job now to pollinate all these almond trees. We've been able to get away with um, mono uh, cropping and monoculture type farm systems where all we are growing is a single species of plant. We have uh, erased, destroyed um, diverse wildlands in favor of this monoculture. And so European honeybees um, are the only ones that will pollinate that because our native bees um, prefer a much more biodiverse, habitat-rich environment in which to live. So when that environment is destroyed in favor of a monoculture type farm, they either leave or they die because their habitat was taken away. And so you end up relying on European honeybees because they don't really have a choice. You've taken their home and you've put it um, in, this, in this particular farm. If you want to think about um, a metaphor for why our native bees wouldn't um, stick around a, an almond orchard, uh, think about whether or not you would want to live somewhere that only had Togo's restaurants. Every block was a Togo's. That's all you could get. If you were in the mood for sushi, you could get Togo's. And if you were in the mood for Mexican food, you could get Togo's. And if you were in the mood for Vietnamese food, you could get Togo's. And, and so why would a native bee stick around somewhere that had the exact same food source everywhere, couldn't get any diversity or anything interesting? They wouldn't. And because you can't domesticate them, because they're solitary, you can't put them in a hive and force them to do it, they will leave. And so a lot of really forward thinking farms are getting the clue 
that they need to incorporate native ecology into their farms. And they're starting to put pollinator hedgerows along their farms, um, either surrounding their farms or within the farms to attract more diverse pollinators into their farms so that they don't have to rely so much on the European honeybee, um, that they they allow that, I mean, because the native bees, they, they will go after uh, almond flower, but not if that's the only thing that there is. So, so there's um, a nice blend that's occurring where some of our farms are starting to adapt uh, adapt to um, you know more ecologically sound practices um, which is really really hopeful and also is something that we can be doing in our own yards pollinators are not just you know um, insects we also have you know hummingbirds that uh, pollinate our uh, our plants sometimes and another one that we have a negative bias about are flies I'm not talking about the housefly, and I'm not talking about the one that eats feces. We're talking about, again, another group of insect that is highly uh, diverse and interesting and important and essential for pollination. And so there's, uh, again, and also pest control. The, the, the fly on the left is a hoverfly or a surfeit fly. Um, and so we'll see later on some of their pest control um, activities in action. So, so flies are also things that we need to be realizing. There's a, there's a whole diversity of, of insect life that we don't even have in our, in our gardens because we don't have the plants that attract them. And so that's where native plants, having diverse native plants, um, it invites this kind of wildlife in to, to perform all these ecological functions. And what is the ecological function of pollination? To create seeds and fruit and berries and things that further beget more life. So we have uh, the uh, cedar waxwing um, birds here as adults now, right? They're not babies anymore, so they don't need the caterpillars, but they do eat berries. And this toyon shrub is a, a shrub that has berries in the wintertime when most other things are uh, naked, don't have much to offer the birds. This one is full of red berries. And so all that pollination activity that was occurring in the summertime, these, these red berries are clusters of white flowers. All that pollination activity in the summer made it so that this shrub was really, really fruitful and that the um, birds would able, be able to eat. And then when the birds eat, then they go and fly off. And, and then when they, I don't know, a graceful way of saying excrete, <laughs> when they uh, poo, um, they drop the seeds of the, the toyon because the, the flesh got digested, but they drop the seeds that hits the earth, which again, if conditions are right, will create a new toyon shrub. So the entire chain of life process um, is just creates this ripple effect outward of more and more life. And so that's really, really an essential piece where insects lead all the way up to some of those higher animals um, and also to the, the continuation of the plants themselves. So how can we rethink some of the things that we do in our gardens? So now we've, we've decided, okay, so we're going to include native plants into our gardens. That's going to attract more uh, diverse uh, uh, insect life, bird life, maybe lizard life, and the, the whole chain of the food web will, will start from those plants. But what are things that we do in our garden that we can either stop doing or rethink or unlearn in order to uh, keep the garden at its highest level of habitat value. One of the things is to preserve old flower husks or seed heads until the seeds are gone. So one thing that we have a tendency to do is once we see uh, a flower starting to diminish, it doesn't look so nice anymore, and maybe there's a little bit of brown on it, we cut it off. Um, and we, we don't like to see any bit of brown on our plants. Um, but the truth is, is that the purpose of flowering is to create seeds in the plant's mind. Um, and uh, once the seed is formed, then it invites new life there. And so what you're doing when you're letting seeds ripen on your plants is you're providing a very natural outlet for um, birds to, to practice their foraging um, activities in a very natural way. Again, you're not enticing the birds to do anything that's outside of their wild instincts. It's just that you're inviting them into your yard where you get to watch. Um, and so. You don't need to buy bird seeds. Seeds are bird food. I'd like us to also rethink the concept of actively feeding birds with um, bird feeders. The reason for that, and there, uh, there are quite a few, if you can't be without it, um, that, that's one thing, but 
keep in mind that in the wild, when birds are feeding, they naturally practice a, a certain form of social distancing, since we're all very familiar on that term. There's a, a certain natural social distancing when birds are in the wild. You don't see 20, 30 birds all on the same branch uh, or all on the same plant or all on the same area, um, all congregating. But in a bird feeder, they do. Not only do they do, uh, do that, but other species that normally wouldn't be interacting in the same space with other species, um, they're all congregating on the same space. They're all touching the same space. They're all pooping in the same area. Forgive me for using that word, but they're defecating in the same area. Um, they're touching with their beaks the, the same object. And so bird feeders inadvertently become hotbeds of pathogens. They become vectors for disease, viruses and parasites that actually end up affecting your, your bird population without you knowing it. So um, the same is true with hummingbird feeders. Um, aside from the fact that uh, sugar water does not have the same level of micronutrients that uh, uh, flower nectar does, um, again, you're having lots of hummingbirds touching with their mouths, the same thing that lots of other hummingbirds touch with their mouths. Um, and so you're, you end up having a lot of potential for harming the populations that you of, of animal that you love so much. And so one compromise, if you're not gonna be, you know, getting rid of your bird feeder or hummingbird feeder would be to make sure that you're emptying it and disinfecting it regularly. Um, I would say every couple of weeks, um, at least to be emptying it and putting it in, you know, some boiling water or a diluted bleach solution or something like that. Um, but once you have a really habitat rich yard, you don't need to do that. You don't need to um, put the food out. You, you get to watch them perform their, their wild um, activities with the plants themselves. And that's something that's really essential is to um, promote the, their natural behaviors. Another thing that you might need to stop doing um, or consider doing less of is using pest, uh, pesticides in your landscape. I would say 95, if not 99% of the time, pest, uh, pesticides are used in a, in a home garden. It's, it's completely unnecessary. Um, the world is full of natural pest managers, everything from lizards to praying mantises, praying man, I don't know the plural for that, um, but, uh, and then ladybugs as well. And so they will take care of a lot of your pest issues. And, but if you're always spraying on your, um, your plants, they, they won't even know that there are pests there. And so they're not gonna be attracted to the buffet. So uh, more natural pest management at work. Uh, a lot of people have an issue with aphids. Of course, they're unsightly. They, the, the leaves of the, the, you know, the plant that's affected with the aphids will start to curl. Uh, people don't like to see them. It looks like an infestation. But if you leave it there long enough, usually, and again, if you have a nice biodiverse um, garden with native plants, you'll have a lot of the insects around that'll help take care of that problem for you. So I talked about the surfid fly on the fly slide earlier. The surfid fly larva is eating an aphid in this picture. So the surfid fly will locate uh, while it's hovering around with wings, it will locate a plant that has aphids, it will lay an egg on that plant, then that egg will hatch into this little guy that almost looks like a caterpillar in the bottom picture, and then they, that thing will gobble up aphids its whole life cycle until it, it eventually pupates and becomes its own um, hoverfly. So um, that is just natural pest control in action. But if you sprayed that plant, you saw five aphids, and you're like, ah, aphids, I better control it before it gets out of hand, and you sprayed it, you might have been spraying this little larva. You might have been spraying the eggs that would have taken care of it for you if, you if you waited a little bit longer. Likewise, the aphid mummies in the picture on the right, there are such a thing as parasitoid wasps. Again, everyone goes, ah, wasps, yellow jackets, they'll sting me, scary, scary. These are harmless, Beneficial insects, there are so many wasps that perform both pollination and pest control management um, and that are very, very essential parts of the ecosystem. So they will find aphids in your garden. They will lay their eggs inside the aphid bodies. The eggs will hatch, eat the aphids from inside out, and then exit, leaving behind this shell of an aphid. So if you ever are looking at an aphid infestation on your plants and you see any of these kind of bronze discolored uh, bodies, they're not moving anywhere, they're just kind of sitting there, then you had a parasitic wasp or parasitoid wasp take care of that problem for you. That's natural pest management. They exist in the world, but the thing that you have to do, or rather not do, 
is not use pesticides. Um, you have to allow the problem to be there for them to know that there's food for them. Um, and so that's something that some people are unwilling to do, but this is something that's more economical. Um, they're taking, you know, they're taking it uh, under their own natural instincts. They're taking care of the problem for you. So you don't have to spend the money or the, the headache uh, to take care of it yourself. So here again, another very familiar beneficial insect. Everyone knows about ladybugs. Not everyone knows what the juvenile ladybug looks like in the top frame there. So that's a, a you know baby ladybug essentially. And all they do is eat aphids all day long and they gobble them up. And some people see that and they go, oh, that's scary. It's black. It's a yucky bug. But a lot of those things that you're scared of, you don't know about, they might be your helpers in the garden and not even know it. So the lacewing also will, will lay an egg that has this little filament. And then they, their little larvae look um, a little bit, again, not so attractive, bottom left um, slide or bottom left picture. And so they go, ah, oh, it looks like a, almost like a caterpillar again, or it looks like another bug. What are they doing? They're eating aphids for you. So support the helpers by not spraying pesticides all over your plants because you'll be likely killing the helpers along with the bad guys. And then if you don't have a healthy population of your natural pest controllers, then you're gonna be having to give pesticides every single year, which costs you money and it harms the environment and it ends up being a waste of your time. So facilitate natural, um, natural pest control by kind of backing off of that. That doesn't mean that in every single situation, um, backing off will solve the problem, but most most situations do. The one exception I'm thinking is like Argentine ants that are highly invasive ant species that, that actually create um, higher issues with um, uh, certain pests like aphids and scale. They don't have natural predators, unfortunately. That's what makes them or categorizes them as invasive. That is something you might have to resort to like a borax solution or something like that to take care of. But most other things have natural predators. Aside from insects, we have hummingbirds that also take care of, um, uh, you know, some of that pest management. They eat aphids, gnats, beetles, mites, mosquitoes. And why do I have a picture of spider and a spider web? Not only do spiders deal with population regulation of other flying insects, but look at the nest on the left. That nest is tiny. It's about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. That's a hummingbird nest. And it is affixed to the branch that it is on with spider webs. So hummingbirds will harvest spider webbing to help in the construction of their own nests. So when we talk about um, habitat providing for all life stages of wildlife, it's essential that we provide stuff for all life stages, meaning we don't omit certain things just because they're slightly unsightly or they have an ick factor or something like that. It's not enough to support adult animals. We have to also support the, the process of their reproduction if we want a really healthy, thriving kind of habitat uh, and, and ecosystem. So the spider, um, it doesn't mean that you need to leave every single spider web that you see, or if it's across your walkway, like, no, I, I shouldn't touch it because the hummingbird won't be able to, to make its nest. If it's totally inconvenient and, and in your way, certainly do what you need to do for maintenance. I'm not suggesting that you have a Halloween, you know, cobweb looking backyard um, that's just covered in webbing. But what I am suggesting is that you um, resist the urge to clear your, your whole yard of any kind of webs or clear your yard of any evidence of, of insects or anything like that, because all of those are really, really critical and, and form um, a really integral part of the, the whole food web and the whole reproductive um, kind of cycle of, of lots of different animals. Another thing you can stop doing is blowing away all your leaves and, and putting them in the trash all the time. Um, leaves are really, really important. We recommend you leave the leaves. Um, that doesn't mean leave them on your walkways. You can certainly clean them off of any hardscape, um, your patio, you know, they shouldn't necessarily look messy, but in planters um, or on open ground, highly recommend that you leave natural uh, leaf litter uh, on the ground. When it decomposes, it provides nutrients into the soil. It feeds all sorts of microorganisms in the soil, as well as a, a layer of insects that lives in the interface of the uh, the leaf litter and the soil. And um, and 
on top of which you would be avoiding, uh, ideally avoiding the very, very noisy um, and very, very polluting leaf blowers that I highly recommend um, stop being part of the norm of, of gardens. Uh, the leaf blower uh, level of, of air and um, noise pollution is, is beyond healthy levels. And I think that anything that can reduce air pollution and reduce disturbance uh, of, the, of the, you know, the quality of life of your neighbors is good. So raking or sweeping leaves and allowing them to decompose naturally is kind of the way to go if you want a, kind of a healthier, healthier yard, healthier air, and kind of just a better, better overall neighborhood um, atmosphere. And you will be supporting, if you leave the leaves, this lovely little species called the California toey. This is a local bird that loves to scratch in the leaf litter. It's one of its favorite pastimes. So if you have a bunch of leaf litter, you will be inviting a lot of these toeys into your yard where you get to see them do their little scratching dance and uh, picking of insects under the leaf litter, which they can, again, go and uh, feed to their babies. Another thing to do or not do is, uh, you know, avoid pruning your trees and shrubs during the nesting season. The nesting season you can think of in terms of just spring and summer. Ideally, late fall, early winter is probably the best time to prune your trees. Um, winter is kind of nice too if you have deciduous trees because you can just um, avoid having to, to haul away a bunch of leaves and you're just dealing with, you know, branches and you can see what you're doing. The other thing I will say is that wildlife will benefit from the less you do to the trees. Uh, tree trimming should really be limited to trimming it for health. So if it has a disease issue, it needs to, a limb removed that has disease or something like that, or dead branches need to come off. So for health, for strength and stability, and that's when a, a certified arborist comes in handy. They know how to prune it so that it's structurally really sound. It's not gonna have weak branches that fall. Um, so for strength and stability, for health, and then of course for any regulations, if you have, you know, legally you have to remove something or if there's some kind of a fire hazard or, or something like that, then you can certainly um, prune your trees then. But the, the type of maintenance that is often done is an aesthetic annual trimming. And anyone who convinces you that that kind of annual trimming is necessary for your trees is uh, incorrect. That is not only not necessary for your trees, it's costly to you and it's costly to the environment. Because when we plant trees, we plant them for not only the shade that they're providing and the wildlife habitat that they're providing, but we also plant them in order to clean the air. And if every year gas powered vehicles are coming to your house Gas-powered tools are pruning your tree. A gas-powered wood chipper is chipping all that material. Gas-powered vehicles are hauling that back to another place that has gas-powered vehicles that process it. All of that pollution associating with your tree negates the benefits and the air cleaning quality of your tree. So you, one can be said if everyone is doing that on their trees and doing that on all their trees, that trees are actually contributing towards pollution rather than what the purpose of them is, which is to uh, clean the air. So I highly recommend that you allow trees to do what they're supposed to do with the least amount of interference, except in the case, obviously, where there's a structural issue when it's about strength or health. That, that those are the only reasons to really mess with your trees. Your birds will thank you because then you're messing with their, their habitat less. The trees will thank you because ultimately they want to get as big and happy as possible. And then the air and the neighborhood and, and, and you will thank you uh, because the quality of life will be vastly improved. So depending on where you live, you might encounter not very many people encounter bears, but uh, depending on where you live, you might encounter wildlife issues. Uh, and depending on what you, uh, if you're in a wildland interface zone, those wildlife issues might have to do with deer, coyotes, bears. If you're um, more urban, maybe it's about rats and skunks or possums. And so um, what I will tell you is that most problems with wildlife, when you encounter problems with wildlife, they are preventable. They are largely human generated. And so I'm going to talk to you about a few things that you can do uh, to minimize the risk that 
um, you encounter any issues with wildlife. Because thus far, what I've shared with you is how do we attract and support wildlife in a natural way that um, fits within the greater ecosystem that requires less of you and has no real negative impact to you. It's a, it's a passive enjoyment of the creation of habitat using native plants and, and the creation of habitat by avoiding certain um, detrimental practices. So how do we cause problems with wildlife and how can we you know, avoid them? So one thing is active feeding. Active feeding is probably the single most problem creating um, thing that you can do with wildlife. And it comes usually from a, either a negligent uh, place or a place uh, of good intentions, but is ultimately really harmful. So for example, if you leave your pet food out uh, and, and then raccoons and rats and possums uh, start making uh, a beeline for your house every night because they're used to you having pet food out. Um, and then all those animals tend to be, you know, in high numbers, in close proximity, could become a vector for disease um, for you and your, your pets. So it's really important that you always keep pet food indoors, or if you feed um, animals outdoors, uh, like your, your own dog, for instance, that you have a certain designated time that they eat, and then the second that time is over, you remove the pet food bowl. Um, there should be no food left out. Um, we already touched on bird feeders. Nuts for squirrels is another thing where, you know, uh, we do not need to support the squirrel population. Um, the squirrels that are in our neighborhood are the eastern fox squirrel. They're actually an invasive squirrel from the east, uh, east coast of, of this country. Um, so they uh, do not need assistance. They, they breed and, and reproduce and find food just fine without you. Um, and they can become quite the pest if you love your squirrels and you feed them nuts and then they go and, and reproduce to, to high levels and then they um, are all over the place and then they're eating every single apple off of your neighbor's tree and you know, you, you're you generating a pest problem for other people because they, they kind of take over the neighborhood. So please don't help them, uh, help their population. They don't need it. Um, I will also say active feeding of coyotes is an absolute no-no. And most people listening to this probably already know that. But it's important that we, we think about the, um, the value of preserving the, the survival instincts um, and wildlife abilities uh, or wild instincts of wildlife when we're dealing with wildlife. And one way that we can really harm a species is through um, making them dependent on us for food or making them reliant on us for food. They need to retain the strongest survival and uh, instincts possible to be able to withstand the future. And when we make them dependent, we are harming them. Um, we also are bringing them into a, a world of human activity. Uh, we're feeding them often you know, in our, uh, on our streets, which is making them come into populated areas with cars, which would make them more susceptible to getting hit by cars. We are tra training them to think that it's okay to, for their mouths to get near human hands, right? To, to accept food from human hands. So if they do that to a child, or if they do that to another person who wasn't gonna actively feed them, and then that person complains, then that coyote is destroyed. So it's really, really critical. Your coyotes in your neighborhood will not stop eating your cats if you feed them chicken. That is a, a fallacy that if you feed them, then they won't go after the neighborhood cats. That's, that's nonsense. They're predators. They have every instinct to still hunt. Um, and, uh, but if you get them so used to uh, human food, they don't, they're not going to, um, you know, actively use that instinct uh, when it's necessary. They're going to just do it for fun with your cats, but they're not necessarily going to do it for, for key survival reasons. Um, and, and you want them in wild areas. You want coyotes to retain, stay in wild areas as much as possible. They, again, they don't need necessarily any assistance or help uh, in surviving in urban areas. Keep your um, free roaming and unsupervised pets 
indoors as much as possible. And I mean that about cats in particular. We've already talked about the dangers of coyotes and cats, um, but we also need to talk about the danger that cats pose to all other animals. Um, so uh, for instance, lizards and songbirds, songbird populations are in extreme um, low levels because of domestic cats. Cats and dogs are domesticated. Cats and dogs are not um, natural parts of the ecosystem. Again, these were introduced animals. We have our own natural dogs and cats in the form of coyotes, uh, foxes, bobcats. Bobcats are like oversized domestic cats. I'm not talking about cougars, um, but we also have cougars. We also have the mountain lion. So we have those natural top predators. So when we introduce just hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands and even millions of cats and dogs uh, that are domesticated, we've introduced tons of predators into an area that normally would never sustain that level of, uh, that number of predators. And so when your cat um, goes and eats a bird and then comes home and then eats your pet food and then goes out and kills birds, it's never getting that natural checks and balances. The checks and balances of the predator-prey relationship is when the prey population plummets, the predator population plummets because there isn't enough food. But when we keep feeding our domestic animals, they don't respond to that predator-prey dynamic. And so you just keep getting prey populations that are hitting rock bottom repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. So it's really, really critical that if you have cats, and this is coming from someone who grew up in a household with lots of off, uh, you know, not off leash, um, indoor, outdoor cats, with nary a bird sound to be heard in the neighborhood because of that. Um, you know, I'm telling you from that perspective of having been there, uh, you really want to make sure your cats are indoors. And the cool thing about that is you can build these really cool catios. Um, you can build them or you can have uh, somebody else build them for you that create these really cool outdoor enclosures so your cat can experience the outdoors. It can maybe sunbathe, bird watch, uh, but won't be at risk to uh, wildlife. You can do the same thing for dog runs. If you have a very small dog and you're concerned about coyotes uh, being having access to your yard, you can use a dog run when they're unsupervised um, that has even a top, um, a top to it uh, or um, any kind of fencing. You could install coyote rollers. Coyote rollers will be featured in the next slide just so you know what I'm talking about. But what it does is it kind of prevents coyotes from jumping the fences and getting at your pets. Um, please spay and neuter, not only because you want to reduce <laughs> the population of, of um, the, the animals that we just have so, so many of, but also uh, the pheromones and the hormones of, of animals in heat can attract wildlife to your, uh, to your house in a way that you don't want. So please spay and neuter. Um, contain and seal all your composters. If you do what I do, and that is compost kitchen scraps and yard waste, um, uh, rats and other wildlife might be attracted to the kitchen scraps. So you want to make sure that it's nice and tightly sealed. There are some, um, you know, that are uh, naturally really sealed. Otherwise, you might have to um, reinforce it so that um, you're not attracting rats. Rats will sometimes start breeding in areas where they have that consistent food source. And uh, so they might breed next to your compost, um, compost bin. So make sure all of that is sealed. Same with garbage containers, garbage cans. You don't want um, raccoons um, going in for your garbage. Again, these are animals that don't necessarily need extra assistance to be able to survive. Um, so uh, anything that you do to deter them humanely um, is fine. You're not, you're not necessarily hurting their populations. Um, please regularly harvest your fruits and vegetables from your garden, both because, you know, you should enjoy your fruits and vegetables, but um, the leftovers, the rotting fruit, things like that are going to attract uh, wildlife. The squirrels, unfortunately, will sometimes get the stuff even before it's ripe, uh, so you might have to just protect it from them um, so that you can get it. Um, but if you do leave a lot of, you know, falling, falling fruit or, or rotting fruit, you might attract the unwanted type of um, infestations of rats and things. And speaking of rats, if you do uh, try to control rats, the one way that I would say please do not use um, uh, is, or one way that I would recommend that you not use is a rat poison. So rat poison is um, also called rodenticides, and they often um, end up killing your top predators of, of rats. So when a rat consumes the poison, they become ill or die. Um, and then a hawk or owl or other predator, like a coyote or a fox or wh whatever's nearby you, 
will eat that rat and then they will get poisoned. And rats reproduce at such a high rate that their populations rebound. Doesn't matter how much poison you put out there, their population's gonna rebound so quickly. But a hawk and an owl and the other top predators, their populations are, don't rebound. They actually suffer really greatly because they don't reproduce so quickly. Um, and so what you end up doing is, again, unbalancing that predator-prey dynamic. Um, and the point is you want more natural predators, not fewer. And so rodenticides promotes fewer natural predators uh, rather than more. And so please avoid rodenticides if you're dealing with rats. If you do have an infestation, if you are going to do lethal means, which again is not recommended necessarily, I'm not telling you to, but between the two, a rat trap that snaps, the rat, the, a cinch trap that just like mechanically, you know, crunches their body in a snapping fashion is much more ecologically humane than rat poison. So if you have to go one way or the other, the mechanical um, killing of the rat uh, is, is more ecologically sound. But again, the best way to, to prevent a rat issue is to prevent a rat issue, is to not put the things that the rats are gonna be attracted to. So is to take care of all those other things we talked about, garbage, pet food, um, composters, fruits and vegetables, et cetera. So for those of you who are uh, you know, curious about the coyote rollers, this is the coyote roller on a fence. So the, the idea is that the coyotes jump and they use their four paws to, four paws meaning the ones in the front, to push off the top so that they can get inside. But when this thing rolls them backwards and they fall on their backside. So this is actually a really good kind of deterrent if you have uh, coyotes jumping the fence. A few other ways to prevent wildlife problems. Um, Planting strategically, planting certain species that are highly fragrant, like our native sages, or plants that have prickly or toothed leaf margins, um, or thorny plants, those are much less likely to be eaten by deer if you do have a deer issue. Um, you can also use motion-activated sprinklers to deter deer or coyotes or even large, you know, raccoons, other large animals. Keep in mind, they will also spray your dog if your dog uh, activates them. You can fence baby plants until they're big enough to withstand, withstand getting occasionally browsed, browsed meaning uh, nibbled on. So uh, you might consider just putting up a little fence or a cage um, around the baby plants and uh, for about a year, maybe two years as it's growing. And then even if it does get nibbled on a bit, it's not too big a deal. Uh, likewise, underground, you can use go, uh, gopher mesh or uh, baskets to protect the roots of plants underground. Um, and uh, some people say you can drop fabric softener sheets, peppermint oil, or other natural deterrents into the gopher hole to, to keep them away. I don't know 100% if, um, if that is super effective, only because I know that gopher tunnels can be very, very elaborate. Um, so you might deter them from that one entrance, but they can easily find another area to, to cause trouble in your garden. Um, so what I would say is also keep in mind that in the wild, uh, in a nice, healthy ecosystem in the wild, there's rarely gopher problems. There are gophers, but they rarely become the kind of like issue that we create um, in, in our kind of human world. And the reason for that is they have avian predators, you know, right? So they have predators from the sky, they have predators on the ground, and they have predator underground. So they have the hawks and owls from the sky, they have foxes, coyotes, and bobcats on the ground level, and then they have gopher snakes that both eat them and then kind of use their, their tunnels uh, system for their own holes uh, and for their own homes. And so uh, in the wild, they have so many predators. So here we've excluded snakes, we've excluded coyotes usually, we've excluded bobcats usually, we've uh, unfortunately are poisoning our, our owls and hawks. And so we have this thing called gopher problems um, that again were, were originally preventable and have in the wild their, their natural, uh, you know, predators. So that's something to consider. Sometimes your own domestic dog can fill in for where the natural predators are, are lacking, but um, you know, it, it can be tricky. So that's why you might need to just have a mechanical kind of like uh, method for, for keeping them away from the roots of your plants. And that's where the baskets and the mesh come in. Uh, one other thing you can do uh, to reduce certain types of pests is reducing turf and water thirsty vegetation. Turf meaning your lawns. 
uh, water thirsting vegetation, just stuff that you always have to be watering. Really moist yards are attractive to slugs, they're attractive to snails, they're attractive to the animals that eat slugs and snails, like raccoons and things. Um, and slugs and snails, of course, eat plants. And so if you want to uh, reduce that, uh, you should consider uh, a drought tolerant native garden, something that you don't have to water um, very, very much. My own garden has been minimally irrigated for about a decade. And probably in the last 10 years, I've counted maybe five snails in my entire time of being in my garden, which is a lot. So uh, that's just how not a thing they are um, when you have a, a drier uh, garden. So basically with all that information that I shared, you're gonna want to assess what works for you Obviously, I've shared a lot of information and some things are going to be like, well, you know, that didn't sound too great for my family or my situation, but this does sound good. So pick and choose what works for you. Again, a coexistence is also the, the co part of coexistence implies that you should also be uh, benefiting from from all of this. It's about um, uh, it's about both parties, both wildlife and human and pets, um, all kind of living together in harmony. So you might have areas where you uh, you know, want to give more towards wildlife, some areas where you're gonna need your needs met, some areas where you might need your pet's needs met a little bit more. And so figure out what works for you. In this example, I have my, my sister had bought a house in La Crescenta and we um, were interested in creating a habitat garden, but they also, my sister and her husband also had a kid um, and also had a dog. And um, the, my, my sister's husband or my brother-in-law loves uh, to have a lawn and they wanted an, an area for their, um, their son to be able to run and the dog to be able to run and for them to be able to entertain. And so we came up with a really nice compromise where the backyard, we retained the lawn and the front yard we created into a wildlife habitat. So um, that's a, a nice little compromise that you're gonna be able to do. You don't have to go all one way or all another way. Um, you can blend it and mix it and kind of find and customize what's best for you, your family and your pets. So this was the before, before we worked on it. And uh, we applied for one of those lawn rebates uh, with their uh, water district. And this was the little after. So we have uh, a really kind of nice um, flowery, native yard with drought tolerant plants. We have areas of bare ground, we have areas of mulch, we have um, different types of flower shapes and colors and seasons and things that bloom at different times. Um, and then because we'd used the rebate, we actually spent less money on it than we got in the rebate. So they actually made money on this lawn conversion um, project. And so you might consider doing that, giving back to uh, nature and also either potentially making up for the expense of of doing that um, or even making a few bucks. <laughs> so peaceful coexistence with wildlife is possible. It's exciting, it's fun, it's interesting. Um, I encourage you to learn more about, about this kind of gardening style. The Theodore Payne Foundation has a native plant garden tour. This um, garden that I'm featuring in this photo was on the tour. Uh, so uh, you can see other people who have done it before you if this is something that you're, you're interested in, in or direction you're interested in heading. The Theodore Payne Foundation has a website, so please visit us on, on our website. We have an online store. You can buy books on this topic. We have classes. Uh, currently, right now, all our classes are online, and you can also buy um, seeds and plants online for pickup at our location. We are currently not open to walk-in um, uh, kind of customers in our nursery, um, but we do have a native plant nursery. Uh, where you can buy plants normally and we will be opening um, for in-person uh, shopping soon. So um, please you know, read more about us, read more about native plant gardening, habitat gardening, wildlife and, and California ecology. If, if any of this is really exciting to you, I, I hope, I wish you luck in your journey uh, attracting and supporting more of our uh, native wildlife. And off to Sarah. Hi, I'm going to join back on screen here for a second. Wow, Catherine, amazing. We're, we're getting uh, lots of amazing uh, questions from everyone. Um, 
lots of thanks already uh, being uh, seen in the chat for, for this presentation. So we really appreciate that. Um, we do love supporting uh, our partner nonprofits. So Theodore Payne Foundation, please check them out. They do amazing work. Um, and also there are ways to support our work with wildlife as well. We have a wildlife department here at Pasadena Humane. Um, I did put that information in the chat. So the best place to start would be pasadenahumane.org slash wildlife. Also, you can email us any of your wildlife questions at wildlife at pasadenahumane.org. We do know that one of the questions we get a lot is in regards to neighborhood um, coyotes. So uh, we do have a flyer um, that you can download and share with your neighbors about ways to um, humanely exclude coyotes from your neighborhood. Um, and there's also a great reporting website with um, UC Riverside where you can uh, report any kind of coyote sightings at Coyote um, Cache. You can see the URL right there. Um, and our, the best way to help is to spread information, right? So share that information about uh, humane exclusion, about how to deter wildlife. Um, and if you are a real wildlife supporter and you wanna know how you can help the animals that are actually in our care, um, we do have ways you can do that from our wish list as well as monthly donations. Um, and you can get more information on that at pasadenahumane.org slash ways to give. All right, so I think Catherine's going to join us back on screen um, because we're going to start our Q&A. Uh, we've I've got a ton of questions um, in the chat, so I'm going to start with the ones that came in. The biggest one we got, Catherine, was the introduction of ladybugs or other insects in, into gardens. Is that something that's recommended? Um, you don't need to. Um, so what we tend to promote is creating habitat so that they naturally come into your yard. Um, sometimes the, the ladybugs that are bred elsewhere um, don't, either they're, they're either species that are slightly not regionally appropriate for this area, or they were bred in certain types of conditions that are not necessarily um, gonna, gonna work in your, your region. So we tend to recommend that you just provide the food and they will come naturally and the ones that come will be really, really acclimated to your zone. And so um, the other thing too is there's, there's always that risk that, um, that introductions of things can introduce potential disease um, amongst the population. So um, it's, it's much better to go with that more organic approach of just, if you build it, they will come kind of a thing, just create the habitat and they will start to come naturally. And as long as you're not killing them every year with pesticides, they're gonna keep building their populations. It's not something that you're gonna have to introduce. We had a uh, question about bees. Actually, we got quite a few. Um, this one was, I have uh, tons of bees happily. Where do my bees go at night? I wanna be sure that I don't remove their nighttime shelter. If you have native bees, many of them are ground nesting and or cavity nesting in wood. Um, you don't really have to worry about um, where they are unless you're you know disturbing the ground where they are but if you're talking about european honeybees then they'll they'll definitely have their own hive somewhere or their colony somewhere um in which case you can't miss it you will not uh be able to disturb them without definitely noticing because again they're very territorial and there's a lot of them at once for native bees then they you know they definitely go into little areas so recently i just weeded an area, not weeded, actually had a wildflower section of my yard and I started removing all the dried wildflowers and then I saw a bunch of little native bees flying around. I had found that they had created all their little nests in the open, uh, in the dirt ground at the base of all the dried wildflowers. So I kind of disturbed them by by uh, removing the the dead uh, the dead matter. But then they they just went back to their to their holes. So you'll see little holes for uh, native bees. You'll see holes in wood or or um, I have uh, some carpenter bees that have a, a nest in their uh, in a in a log that I just have you know just leaving kind of dead wood is sometimes a nice habitat area. So if you're not just like overtly you know, moving stuff around in your yard, usually they, they're, they're just kind of keep to themselves about where they go at night. I'm assuming they're sleeping either in their nests or in the ground or in a cavity or on plants. So some of our native bees will just kind of all clump together on a plant and just fall asleep together. It's actually quite cute. So it's species specific, um, but I just, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, 
messing with them. You'll, you'll see it if you mess with them. And while we're on the topic of mess, messing with things, one of the questions that came in was, are there any leaves that should be left on the ground? For example, um, oak leaves due to their acidity. So with native plant gardening, oak leaves are kind of your way to go, believe it or not. So we love oak leaves. Um, it, but yes, there's sometimes oak leaves can create um, a, a certain type of uh, condition on the ground whereby they, they have certain plants that they're associated with that love it. And so that's where you kind of want to find like your southern oak woodland plant community and plant associated plants with oaks under the oaks. But that decomposing oak leaf litter um, is so essential for the health of that oak tree. So as that's all decomposing, it's feeding the roots of that oak tree. Your oak tree is going to get stronger. Um, so I would leave those on the ground. I have no issue with oak leaves. Uh, Eucalyptus leaves are said to be problematic, so they actually have a really hard time decomposing. I often just stay there forever, um, and it's a little bit harder to garden under those, whether it's the leaves themselves, that the plant itself is allelopathic, where it has, it has qualities that inhibit the growth of other plants. Um, that's been talked about. Whether that's true or not is, is unclear. They tend to kind of suck up a lot of water, so it's very dry under there. Again, it's harder for plants to grow under them. So I would probably remove eucalyptus leaves, but oak leaves, I would, I would encourage you to support a habitat that is really, really good for, for your oak tree um, and, and plant associated plants for the oak, because the oak supports like over 300 species of animals. Like it is such an essential, it's a, such an essential host plant for caterpillars and songbirds and lizards and, and everything all the way up the food chain. You can like start the, um, the food chain from that oak tree and it supports everything from like the tiniest insect to, to your, your top predators. So it's a really critical, critical ecosystem tree. Um, and part of its health is in uh, the, its ability to leave its leaf litter on the ground, have that decomposing and, and feeding the, its own root system. So leave those if you can. Um, Catherine, uh, we did get some questions about where homeowners uh, could find um, information or guides on native plants um, that they could plant if they were interested in adopting uh, a native garden. Yeah, so the Theodore Payne Foundation has a lot of resources. Another really great, um, I mean, you can also Google search a lot of this stuff. So uh, depending on where you're at, you can find your the most local either nursery or education center with regards to this kind of gardening. But the Theodore Payne Foundation is kind of really nice because it touches a lot of areas in and around LA. Um, and so uh, the Theodore Payne Foundation's website is great. It has a lot of really good books at, in its online bookstore. Um, so there's a lot of good references there. If you're interested in learning specifically about like which plants do well in certain environments, calscape.org is a really good um, website, you can type in your zip code, say kind of like what kind of general plant you, you're looking for, and it'll give you a list of um, species that work in your region or your area. So that's a really good one. Calflora is a little bit more specific. Calflora.org is a little more specific to, um, you know, native plant species. Uh, it's a little more like botany focused, so that might not be as much of uh, the landscaping thing, but Calscape, uh, Theodore Payne Foundation, there's a lot of other good websites. Las Palitas uh, Nursery is a, is a nursery in Santa Margarita, but it has a really nice comprehensive website that really helps homeowners who are starting this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good things. You can just Google search, um, YouTube it, take our classes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of good content out there. Fantastic. Um, another question we got was for those um, who don't necessarily have yards, um, are there any types of uh, plants that do well in pots that um, might be native and could attract um, certain insects? Yes, absolutely. So that's the great thing is like you can create habitat even on a very small scale. So even from a balcony, um, what is ideal is that you have some sunlight. Um, so there are some things that do okay in shade, but generally speaking, uh, some of those flowery things that are going to be attracting more pollinators uh, do require a little more sunlight. So if you have sunlight, but just a balcony or sunlight and, and just a, you know, a small, small space, um, uh, for, for a few container plants, you can definitely pick some of the smaller native, uh, I would actually go with a, 
there are types of buckwheat plants. Um, so California buckwheat or red buckwheat, um, some of the smaller forms of buckwheat have flowers that are extremely attractive to uh, insects and pollinators. So if you're wanting to you know, attract your butterflies, attract your bees and things like that and support them that way uh, with a high kind of like nectar producing um, and flowery plant, then I would go with something like a buckwheat. Uh, so that's something you can you know, type in California buckwheat and learn learn all about it. And you can learn about the different varieties and, and so and such. Um, but container plants are also something I don't know 100% off of our website right now if our if our database has has that listed. But you can usually search on our uh, Theodore Payne online store, like searching plants for screening, searching plants that um, are you know drop tolerant or not or this or that like based on conditions so i haven't checked 100 percent to see if there's one that's like good container plants um but you might you might look to see if it has that on our website in which case like a list would come up of things that that do well in containers another question that came in um was when is the best time to plant natives in our area so generally um what you hear the rule of thumb for native plant gardening is to plant in the fall. I don't, um, the fall of when that uh, statement came around was very different than fall now. Fall now is very, very hot. Fall is like second summer. So um, what I would recommend is late fall or winter um, is generally the best time to plant native plants. And the reason for that is you're planting it during the cooler time of year and you're planting it when we get rain hopefully. Um, and so if you're planting it at that time, the, the inputs that you have to give um, to get them started are less. And so you kind of just have um, the help of, of the rainfall getting your the root systems established. So there's a good class called Right Plant, Right Place uh, that we do once a month at the Theater of Pain Foundation. Right now it's a Zoom class. So that talks gives you kind of the basic overview of how do we plant native plants, um, you know, from what size pot, what time of year, how do we get them established? Just all those basic native plant horticulture questions that you might get. So I would definitely start with that kind of introductory class if you're getting into this kind of gardening style for the first time. Generally, it's in the winter. Um, spring is also really nice. Midsummer, fall, early fall, it's just really, really hot and the, your success rate is gonna be lower. It's not impossible, but it's not ideal. Um, we have um, obviously some um, native plant and uh, native wildlife experts joining us today. We got one question, which I'm going to throw out at you and let's see if you <laughs> how it goes. Um, so the person says it might be too specific, but I'm thinking of planting and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this, a Mahonia Navini, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, to attract Western bluebirds, but will they come to a suburban garden? Um, those birds thus far, um, from my understanding are not, they prefer like an, a rural type environment or a wildland setting. So I personally have um, the Nevins barberry shrub and I have not seen that species in my yard. Um, you can plant a ton of them and see if they come. But like most things, same with butterflies when people are like, I want to attract the, the El Segundo blue butterfly. So I'm going to plant such and such buckwheat that's going to attract them. But if you're not in the natural like range of that, that specific species, you might not get them. So in the middle of an urban area, if you're like in the middle of the city, the likelihood that you're gonna attract bluebirds is, is slim. Um, if you're in, I don't know, like right next to Griffith Park, maybe. Um, so if you're in a wildland interface zone, I would say that's a likelier like corridor jump to get into your yard. But if you're in um, mid Wilshire or something like that, I think the likelihood that it, a Western bluebird will get to you is slim. That said, doesn't that's not the only bird that really loves that um, species. So you're going to get tons of, um, you're going to get your northern mockingbirds eating the berries. You're going to get other animals eating the berries. You're going to get tons of pollinators on the flowers, and you're going to have birds that are, you know, hiding in it because it's so thorny and, you know, predators can't get through it to to get to the birds. So it's a my favorite. It's actually my favorite plant. Uh, so yay for you suggesting it, but. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't I don't know that you're going to just like immediately get the birds you're looking for. It, dep it depends on where you live. Um, and before we sign off, Catherine, um, would you mind scrolling back to the previous slide just so everyone can see how to get in touch with TPF? 
um, if, if they want more information on, on Theodore Payne. I do want to remind everyone that you will be receiving um, an email with a link to this webinar recording tomorrow. Um, also, we'll be passing on that on to Catherine to share uh, with TPS. Um, and we did get a couple questions of uh, someone asking if they could um, share this video or this webinar. Absolutely, please do. <laughs> We'd love the more people uh, who know, the better. Um, Catherine, I wasn't sure if you had any, uh, any uh, last words before we end the webinar today. No, I'm just thankful that you guys are all here and listening and enjoying and, and watching us live. Um, I think uh, quite a few people are probably just going to be watching the recording. So thank you for making it out during the time um, that uh, we, we are live. And I, I wish you luck. Um, I hope that you um, have a really bountiful and fun garden and get to enjoy um, supporting wildlife and, and, um, and just have kind of just like a fruitful, fruitful habitat. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. And if you have um, any questions, please go ahead and send them to outreach at PasadenaHumane.org. Um, if we can answer them, if they're in regards to wildlife, we'll be sure to help you out. Um, anything plant related, uh, we'll see if we can get over to Catherine. But please be sure to check out um, Theodore Payne for more information. All right, everyone, that's it for today. We hope to see you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>